Welcome everybody, thank you for coming. Um, our talk is UEFI boot for mere mortals. So I appreciate you all to coming out at noon for a talk on UEFI. That shows a lot of uh, stamina. I know lunch is right around the corner. So I'll try and keep this mostly brief. Um, first off, a little bit about us. Uh, my name is Stefano. Uh, I work for Intel and I'm currently the Tiano Core Community Manager. And I'm also an open source firmware and hardware advocate. Um, Alexander will be up next. Uh, he is the KVM and QEMU developer for SUSE, and he is one of the founding members of the SUSE ARM team. So let me start off with a quick demographic check. How many of you, like me six months ago, think of UEFI and you think of a blob five to 10 megabytes that lives in some flash ROM part somewhere that's really complicated? Good. I'm in the right room. Perfect. OK. So let's start with UEFI then. It turns out UEFI is actually just a PDF. So that's what I want you to think the next time you think of UEFI. UEFI is a series of PDFs. And if you are s looking for a sleep aid, I would highly recommend reading the entire thing. Uh, but really, you can use it as a reference for how the specification of UEFI is laid out. Um, the definition is actually in several parts. So platform initialization is one of the things that's defined in its own specification. Um, boot and runtime interfaces are defined. ACPI, which is its own talk and which I am not qualified to give, is its own specification. Uh, and UEFI shell is another specification. So when you think of these things, don't think about implementations. Think about specifications that define an interface a way to standardize calls in to hardware. And that gets me to what the point of UEFI is, which is really standardization. And it's the standardization of the transition from hardware into some payload. And that payload could be Grub, it could be Linux, it could be lots of things, but the transition from hardware in it into that payload is what UEFI is all about. So let's talk a little bit about how that process works. Uh, how many people here understand what a reset vector is? Raise your hand. OK, a good number. Excellent. Well, for those of you who don't know, once the magical world of hardware has done the thing it needs to do, it's going to pull the reset line low. And that's its way of saying, hey, all that stuff I'm not going to tell you about is done now. And there's a pointer to some, well, there's a place in memory where you can go, and it promises it'll start executing instructions, assuming it did its job right. Um, so UEFI is concerned with what happens when you get to that place. What do we do next? It's concerned with the most basic fundamentals of hardware initialization, like DDR memory initialization. So getting the timing right, making sure that you can write something to memory. Uh, understanding where the media is that you're going to boot from, and initializing some silicon-specific stuff like, UE, uh, like uh, PCI or USB or even simple stuff like UARTs. Um, so that's everything from the hardware end. And you can sort of think about that in terms of the initialization of the hardware. Then from the payload end, there needs to be a way to look back into that firmware, sort of a thin interface to look into the hardware and make calls. And that's where UEFI comes in. It creates these standard definitions of how do we do things? How do we call back into that firmware? So sign capsule update is one of my favorite examples because I think it's one of the less known features that UEFI enables. Um, so the LVFS, uh, which I've written down, Linux vendor firmware service, mm -hmm. is a really exciting thing that you should go look up because it, again, is its own talk on its own. And uh, Mike Kinney from Intel did a great talk recently on that at Lenaro Connect. Uh, HTTPS boot, if how many people here know what Pixie boot is? Excellent. I really am in the right room. Um, we would really like for that to go away. And for those of you who raised your hand, you should, <laughs> you should know why. We really want that to go away. And HTTPS boot is a great way to make that go away. Um, uh, graphics output protocol is just another good example of how we standardize something like how you interact with a frame buffer. But these are all ways that that payload that I talked about can then look back into the hardware and make calls and in some standard way so that you don't have to roll everything from scratch. You can know this implements the UEFI spec. I can know what to expect. 
And it's important to remember, too, that it doesn't, the UEFI spec isn't an implementation. It has no interface. It tells you how to write an interface. And that's an important point. Um, so I don't want to spend this entire talk talking about UEFI because there are other really important bootloaders out there. Uh, core boot and slim bootloader are things that, again, could be their own talks, but things that you should go out there and look at. Um, and there are corporate people here in the room, so please throw something at me if I say anything bad. But uh, the idea that I have in my head when I think about things like core boot and slim boot loader is if you want to get to your payload as quickly as possible, the minimal amount of hardware init that you really need to do to get the memory initialized and to get yourself into some payload, that's where core boot really shines. So if you're looking for a quick handoff to some OS, who knows, <coughs> maybe Linux. Um, or some bootloader, who knows, maybe Grub. Um, that's the thing you should be looking at. Um, the idea is that you're booting the OS you want as quickly and efficiently as possible. UEFI really thinks more along the lines of, what if you wanted to boot a whole bunch of operating systems? How do we make that efficient? Um, so this is the slide where I bring two things up on the screen which many of you probably aren't used to seeing, which is UEFI and U-Boot. And this is why I have an expert over here with me because I can't talk to that very well. But I can talk to Tiano Core. UEFI and U-Boot. UEFI <laughs> and U-Boot, indeed. And we have a slide on that. So hardware initialization done in such a way that it isn't minimalistic that you really do want to have something more robust where you could have networking and you could have USB capabilities. Um, providing boot time services and allowing firmware to be updated. And as I look at this slide, I realize easy may want to be in quotes. Um, these are things that are all, that we attempt to address. And one of the things that we really wanted to do with this talk is uh, ex show the ways in which both of these pieces of firmware are really great choices for different things. So don't think of them as competing software. They really are trying to accomplish the same goals, just in different environments. So for one example, uh, U-Boot has been open source since day one. Uh, Tiano Core was open source in 2004. For those of you who have ever tried to open source closed source software, you will know that it is a tad complicated. And so when you look at the code, as, as Frank Sinatra said, please be kind. It's <laughs> there's going to be things there that you're going to have some issues with, but realize that it is the effort to drag that into the open source world that is our goal. Um, so from the Tiano Core side, you've got both uh, platform initialization, so we do the hardware part, and we do that to the UEFI spec, and then we also do. PI spec. I said, what did I say? You want the UEFI spec. Th thank you. To the PI spec. I'm clearly jet lagged. Um, too many acronyms. So we do that to the UEFI uh, PI <laughs> spec. It's twice. We'll hit three times before I'm done, I promise. Um, Yubu, on the other hand, does implement the parts of UEFI that are necessary, um, but just enough so that when you look back into that firmware, you see the things you need to, such that the payload will know I'm in a UEFI compliant environment. Uh, there are numerous platforms available for Tiano Core, and we'll get to that in a different slide. Uh, but as most of you will know, there are an amazing amount of platforms that run Yubu. So there is a huge field to play in there. Um, UEFI shell is implemented in both, and that's a slide that I'll get to later on, too. So EDK2, coming to the part that I think is also somewhat misunderstood. Uh, EDK2 is a number of things. It is a build environment. It's a place where you can uh, build a reference implementation of uh, UEFI firmware. It is not the actual firmware that you're putting on the board, though it does contain it. So there is open source firmware code inside the EDK2 repository. But like with many complicated projects like this, it's hard to put a pin on what all of these words mean, because you have things like UEFI and EDK2 and Tiano Core, and you just want to know what to call the thing you just built. But the thing you just built is custom firmware. Um, so the fact that the open source firmware is in the repo makes it a little more complicated. But the thing that I think is really great about the uh, about this repo is that it has a number of different large corporations contributing to it. And as you all know, large corporations are really good at working together. So clearly it happens seamlessly and there's never any arguments or problems and all the code gets merged flawlessly. <laughs> to combat that effort, we have the open source community that I am working to build. Um, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, 
One of the things to know is that EDK2 has uh, fully validated EDK releases, but you can also work from the master branch, obviously, and then also several stable branches that we release. We release the stable tags on um, three-month cadence. The part that I actually like to talk about, because I feel like a little bit of an expert <laughs> in it, is the Tianocore community, because that's the thing that I'm trying to push. Uh, I've set up monthly community meetings so that people who are engaged in working on the software or just interested in learning more can come and ask questions. We usually have some of the uh, experts in the world of EDK2 and UEFI present so they could answer questions. Or we talk about topics like how do we improve our mailing lists? How do we communicate better as a community? Uh, I'm going to be setting up when I get back from this event um, bug triages so that we can go through Bugzilla in the public sphere and say here are some of the things we found, here are some feature requests, here are some bugs that we're trying to fix. And that gives the community an opportunity to pitch in with a project that is often looked at as really just stuck in the domain of corporations. Um, and we're also working to build a continuous environment, a continuous integration environment, and we're trying to do that in a community-oriented way. So I'm working with people from Core Boot and Linux Boot, and with people uh, from U-Boot to try and make this something that is a community effort to do CI, rather than just going off in the corner and doing it ourselves. I want to talk briefly about EDK2 platforms. So I mentioned that there are some platforms that Tiano Core can natively support. And EDK2 platforms is our way of trying to pull some of that code out into its own repository. So specific hardware, like the BeagleBone, is available there, or will be available there shortly. Um, the uh, stable branches there track the UDK releases. So those completely validated releases get tracked in stable branches. And then we currently have development branches, which I will admit need a lot of cleanup. But if you're trying to get that hardware booted just so that you can play around with it, the, devel the development branches are perfect. Uh, just for that purpose. <laughs> they need a lot of work, though. So some of the boards that we're looking to, um, to get going, obviously the BeagleBone Black, as I mentioned, is something that we're going to be working on. Uh, the AN Up Squared board, which I'll talk about briefly, is something that I'm personally excited about. Um, and Marvel Macchiato Bin. And I'm sure some of you have heard of the uh, Minoboard project, which is a continuing project, and that uh, we hope to continue to support. So I'll talk briefly about the uh, AN UpSquared board. So the UpSquared board is really interesting. It's got a whole lot of really fun I.O., and it actually has a Max 10 FPGA on it. So there's a lot of possibility in this board, and we currently got it booting Tiano Core as of version 2.7? Oh, it's can I put it? Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, it's, it's been up there for about Okay, yeah, so it's been up there for a little while. So this is one of the things that we're trying to further. We realize that we have open source tooling, we have an open source code base, but we need some form of hardware that everyone can afford, that is readily available, that we can give people to test on. So AN up squared board is one of our first efforts in this area, but we are going to continue and try to push other boards as well. The idea being that we know you need something relatively cheap to put on your desk so that you can play around with this stuff. Um, so this is one of the boards that I'm really excited about. There are a couple other that I'm looking into that I won't talk about here, but catch up with me afterwards and I'm happy to chat about them. So with that, I've talked a lot about UEFI and about EDK2. I'd like to have um, Alex come up and chat with you about uh, Uber. Uh, so I'm the, the upstream UEFI U-boot maintainer, which means that I, I take care of the uh, UEFI implementation parts inside of U-boot. So who of you knows what U-boot is? Very nice. Who of you understands what the bullet points mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'll quickly go through them. Um, so so important, uh, what one important piece that's intrinsic in, in U-boot is it's it's... Uh, a very open source project. It's, it's all GPL code, it shares code with Linux even in, in a couple of cases. Um, you can really think of it more as a, as a long stretch boot face arm of Linux almost. Right? It's, it's, it's a very open source, intrinsically open source, community based uh, product, uh, product uh, project. Um, the idea of U-Boot has always been to be as small as you can and as fast as you can. So you want to be out of the boot phase as soon as, you, as possible. Um, which means you, you want to be really, really quick and small. Um, one of U-Boot's amazing features is, is Falcon Boot, where you, you basically do pretty much nothing until you, you're up in, in, in Linux land, um, which is a similar goal to what Core Boot is trying to do. Um, which 
basically goes hand in hand with where it's targeted. So uh, U-boot is really, really big whenever you get to embedded appliances where you have vertical integration of the whole stack. You want to just, you, you, you want to control what your boot environment does because you don't want to have that uh, throw anything in your face while you're running, which usually happens on normal x86 big servers because vendors happen to add amazing new features into their SMM mode, which happens to run while you happen to run your operating system and suddenly you're losing real-time ability. Yeah. Um, U-boot is, is trying to avoid any of that. You're, you're basically trying to get out of the business as fast as you can, which means um, it's ideal for an embedded appliance. You, you, you can, if, you, if there's a bug, you can fix it um, because it's all open source and uh, you can uh, you, you do control what happens, uh, which means if you if you find any latencies or issues, you can you can actually resolve them. Um, it because of its heritage in the Linux community and, and and people around there, the whole coding style looks like Linux. So if you are a Linux developer, contributing to U-boot is trivial. Right? You, it, it looks the exact same basically. It's, it's you, you you will know how how the code works within minutes. Uh, and uh, traditionally, U-Boot has implemented very direct boot mechanisms, like, uh, for example, the direct Linux boot, where you just implement the Linux boot protocol so you can hand off really quickly to Linux, because that's what the bootloader's job is supposed to be, right? Hand off really quickly to the operating system. Um, it has its own U-Boot API, which some people use. So, for example, um, some BSDs use the U-Boot API uh, to implement whatever their file system is called, and, and ZFS drivers and whatever additional drivers um, to, to, uh, that they cannot port into a GPL compliant code base uh, in, in a payload. Uh, or they didn't want to have it tainted by GPL. So <coughs> Tiano Core, on the other hand, um, <coughs> is basically, the way I usually put it, it's, it's, it's built to fork, right? Um, you, 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 it's, 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 it's the whole purpose of Tiano Core is that it's a base for people to take and build their own thing with and then ideally never contribute back. We're trying to, I mean, people are trying to change that, right? Um, it's, but, but, but if, you, if you're an HP, you, you don't really want to push your HP enablement back into some open source project because what, what's your value add? What's your, what's your revenue stream for getting open source firmware in there, right? It's, there's, there's very little incentive for them to do so. There's a lot of incentive in enabling communities with uh, those, with, by, by having upstream enabled supports, which is what we're seeing in, in the Tiano Core community now. But in, I would say 99% of Tiano Core based systems out there, firmware out there, is eventually in a closed source environment. Um, it is much bigger than a typical U-boot load is because it supports way more interfaces. It actually has amazing features in there, right? Um, Stefano was talking about HTTPS boot. We don't even have TCP support in U-boot, not even speaking of HTTP or HTTPS, right? Um, this is a, a full-blown operating system. Tiano Core and EDK2, the EDK2, the words are terrible. The, the Tiano Core community has support in its EDK2 project for <laughs> a lot of amazing features. Uh, because of that heritage where it allows you to really do um, closed source firmware, th this is the big market it's in, right? If, you, if, you get, if you're getting a random server today, it's probably going to run some code from this code base. Maybe not everything of it, but a lot of code from the EDK2 code base. Um, coding style-wise, if you are used to politically correctly saying camel case <laughs> code, <laughs> you will feel very natural in, in that UEFI-like environment, in the, in the, in the Tiano Core uh, environment. Um, whereas if you're from a Linux heritage, <laughs> I cannot read that code, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Leif isn't either. Um, so, uh, it implements a lot less uh, interfaces because really, at the end of the day, what you need to implement is this is this is wrong. This should be PI. Um, it implements the the front end interface to have bootloaders and, and anything above running uh, interfacing to uh, to your to your UEFI standard firmware and uh, implement drivers. That's basically it, it. It only lives in a UEFI only world, whereas U-boot lives in in this weird state in between at this point. Um, so what's the whole point of of adding 
uh, UEFI support to U-Boot then, right? Why, why do we want to blow it up with more code to actually uh, give us something that we already have a nice implementation for? Why, why, why do something more? Well, turns out um, abstraction interfaces are a good thing uh, because using this small UEFI <coughs> implementation, it's not feature complete, it doesn't implement everything, everything from the spec, but it implements enough to boot into Linux, to boot into BSD, to boot into Grub. It, it, most things you want to run except for Windows work just fine. Um, <coughs> because both implementations implement the UEFI spec to that point, you can then have the exact same boot flow regardless of which environment you live in. If you have a, a U-boot based environment, you can just run the exact same binaries as you can on, on a UEFI uh, on, a, on an EDK2 based system. And see, even I get the words wrong. Uh, so this is all possible because we basically have this abstraction interface. And this abstraction interface is what the UEFI spec is all about. Uh, and what you see down here looks artificial, but really what it enables you is it enables you to boot any standard distro that you want. And I just happen to care about the OpenSUSE one most. <laughs> um, any, any standard distro you want, uh, regardless of what is there on the upper layer. It, it really just is an abstraction interface. Right. Uh, it's, I imagine it like the JavaScript engine for, for, for firmware, almost. I'm sure that's better example. Uh, <laughs> so what, what, what this leads to is, um, the, the, the really nice benefit of it is uh, the number of, or the, the, the overlap of machines that each firmware runs on, th there's very little overlap between the two. Right? So the typical system that's, that you have an EDK2 based system on, it's not the typical system you have a U-Boot based system on. So by enabling the exact same interface, you're suddenly broadening your reach by manifold. Right? You, you can run on pretty much any system these days that is either x86 or ARM based without even thinking about all of this booting stuff. Because people really don't want to be in that business. It just happens to be difficult. But we don't want to make this difficult. We want to make it as easy as possible. So with that, um, you're more than happy to contribute to either one of the two, or even both, or just, I mean, jump between worlds is always, always a great thing. You can reach Stefano um, here with those credentials. The mailing list is up there. Um, patches are always welcome to everything. If you want to implement some cool new feature, um, make Windows boot on U boot. <laughs> feel, feel free to, <laughs> right? It's, it's a great thing to have. And now we have about four minutes left for questions. Because I'm sure you will have some. Yes? How would progress for the UEFI runtime services going on U-Boot? How is progress for the UEFI runtime services going on U-Boot? Um, it depends on what you consider progress. So the... <laughs> <laughs> we, we have had EF, UEFI runtime services from day one. Um, so there's always been runtime service because without runtime services, Linux will just call into null pointers. Sure. Uh, so you have to have something there. <coughs> Admittedly, most of these runtime services implement uh, error, uh, which return minus error, and not implemented, and, and that's it. Uh, there, there are two things um, that we're doing. One is, uh, as part of the EBBR initiative, the Embedded Based Boot Requirements Farm, um, we added a, an ECR to the UEFI spec, uh, which allows you to not implement runtime services. So it's, you, you would finally become spec compliant by not implementing them. So you, if, if you can't change, I mean, if, if, you, if you don't want to, you know what I mean, right? if, if you, what's, what's the, the mountain and the profit thing in English? Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm getting to. Um, so so that, one's, that one's there. Um, the other one is uh, we have a lot of infrastructure to implement runtime services, but it's not as pretty as it should be um, in, in U-Boot right now. Um, and it's intrinsically bound to the way runtime services are done. It's just icky. Uh, there are some suggestions on mailing list today even, um, just, just from this week, on how to clean all that up, that maybe we should build another tiny version of U-Boot inside the build process that only comes with a small device model and only the devices you need for runtime services, and then you embed that into your bigger U-Boot, and you make that your runtime service while you're running. We'll have to see how we, how we get there, right? Um, I think eventually we will want to leverage some of that infrastructure we have in U-Boot for runtime service. Today we don't. It's just function overloads and a couple of sections that you put stuff into. But you can do runtime services if you want to. Uh, yes? So which architectures do you support? Which architectures do we support? In Tiano Core or in U-Boot? <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, uh, for people who don't know, Art Ar Ar is one of the main contributors to, to uh, the EDK2 code base, so he, he, will, he will know all these pieces. Um, in U-Boot, currently we support 
Uh, x86 32-bit, 64-bit, uh, ARM 32-bit, ARM 64-bit, RISC 5 32-bit, RISC 5 64-bit. Uh, yes, I don't think anybody went into MIPS yet. Um, I, we do have people who are interested in PowerPC, so let's, let's see. Uh, yeah? Can I run Ubuntu from Tiana Core? Can you run Ubuntu from Tiana Core? Of course you can. You can, you can run either from either, just whatever. This, this <laughs> yeah. Anything, anything goes. Um, <laughs> you can, you can have U-boot be a an actual payload on an EFI payload. You can have U-boot be a, an EFI operating system which kicks away EDK2 and takes over the machine. At which point you can then run EFI applications from U-boot again. The whole world is open to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the difference What's the difference between Tiano Core and EDK2? That was what Stefano was explaining. You want um, that one or you want me to add? It's very easy. Tiano, Tiano Core is the, is the umbrella project, right? That's, that's, that's basically the, the name for the overall arching project. EDK2 is the toolkit itself that allows you to build firmware. And the firmware that falls out of it doesn't have a name. <laughs> In a nutshell. Yeah, fair. Uh, yeah? Any other things? We have one more minute? One more yeah, question, I guess? Have two more. So, EFI light, what is light? EFI <laughs> light, what is, what is light? Um, what, what is, the, the UEFI spec is, it's not quite 10,000 lines, 10,000 pages here, but it, it's getting close. <laughs> it's, it's big, right? Um, so light basically implements everything you need. <laughs> it, it does not you implement. <laughs> it, it 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 implements enough to make real life use cases from today work. So the the approach is different. The EDK2 approach is let's give you a reference implementation that implements everything that there is in the spec. Whereas the U would approach is let's look at what people actually do use today and what they do need. What what do we need to make Linux work? What do we need to need to make RUP work? What do we need to make uh, to make to make uh, BSDs work, and it turns out all of these have almost the exact same requirements. There's there's very little you don't you don't need additional protocols. You don't you don't need the human interface interface or whatever it's the HII databases and such to to just make uh, Grub work. You do need it for the UEFI shell, so we have it now in Ubuntu because you can now run the UEFI shell. But um, there's a lot of these really really arbitrary weird protocols that nobody usually runs except for very, very specific targeted uh, workloads that I haven't seen yet. Also, you are missing out on any, or on most parts that make up the whole driver environment. We do support some of that. So you can, Heinrich, for example, added amazing code. You can, in U-Boot, you can run iPixie as an EFI payload, which provides a UEFI block device, which gets merged back into a U-Boot block device inside the U-Boot layer, so you have a combat layer, so you can use U-Boot's partitioning code and U-Boot's file system code, which ex exposes a U an UEFI file system protocol again, to, so that you can use that to load, driver, to, to load binaries throughout all those layers. <laughs> so we have, we have some. We have, we have some enablement <laughs> for driver parts, but we don't have a PCI abstraction layer, for example. That, that whole stuff just doesn't exist. That, that's what light means. Light doesn't mean it doesn't boot you. It might just mean uh, things you really don't care about. Meh. <laughs> don't okay, well, we're well, with that. So we are at half past. So, yep, thanks. thanks a lot.